Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from CIBC Wood Gundy tells his quantitative easing for the U.S. did not work out as well as hoped. Adam Hamilton, CEO of ZealLLC.com, warns U.S. corporate earnings continue to drop. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark, investment advisor at CIBC Wood Gundy in Vancouver. Welcome back to This Week in Money. Always a pleasure to be with you, Jim. You've been checking out some of the unemployment stats. What can you tell us? Well, Friday's numbers, uh, the uh, unemployment numbers come out, as we call them, the monthly excitement numbers. Uh, And in this case, there was uh, just some uh, electronic trading going on in the futures where the uh, stock indices and the bond market uh, and uh, no no exchanges were actually open so it's hard to say just how much of a might have been of an overreaction here but the fact is the employment numbers the unemployment rate coming in about five and a half percent in line with expectations but uh, if we take a look at the number of jobs that have been added it was only 126,000 and estimates have been uh, close to 250. And on, on top of that, um, the the nice gain that had been seen in February was pared back uh, by about 30,000, and they pared back also on the January gain by about uh, 40,000. So overall, the revisions um, making the uh, economic conditions look a little weaker than they are. Um, and on top of that, you know, for all that we have a, a an unemployment rate uh, that they call it U3. That's that's the actual unemployment rate. But if you take a look at the broader numbers, like U6, which it takes into account those who um, have gone off the uh, ranks of looking for jobs, uh, they typically that's been at the end of 6 to 12 months, and the group that have been unable to find full-time jobs but are managing to get part-time work just uh, to carry them through, that rate is still up at 10.9%. And that historically, that's a high level still. So um, the you know we're in a position here um, that we've had QE from the U.S. Um, for many times now. It really though hasn't done a lot to create um, uh, employment numbers as far as the economy is concerned. Uh, in Europe, you've had uh, QE you know following through. It's having effect in terms of the equity markets. It's helping them along. Um, the Chinese. Um, into QE as well, and we're seeing improvements over there in terms of the equity markets. But um, on the U.S. side, lack of QE, um, stock markets uh, basically flatlined now on the year. The the S and P and the Dow um, just fractionally up, uh, you know, less less than a half percent. The uh, now um, of note, I say I mentioned uh, late volume trading on Friday because of the um, holiday weekend. The uh, the dollar though. Did give up about one uh, percent on the news, um, and at the end of the day, down about three quarters of a percent. Now, this fits with the larger price pattern that we've been talking about in terms of the dollar. That that it's had this exceptional move in the last year. The dollar index up uh, over twenty five percent into uh, from last spring into uh, February. Um, very, very overbought. The type of uh, readings that we see on relative strength and stochastics that provide us with, uh, you know, some concerns looking for um, decent sized corrections, not just moderate ones. And uh, now with we've had our first sell off into a couple of weeks ago, poor bounce here, and we're starting to see now continuation back down in the dollar index. And for all that the rally took us from basically 80 up to par, and we're sitting at 96 and a half, um, the the real support we should be looking for on a correction would be uh, under 93, maybe down as low as 90. Um, and our longer term view is that as long as we hold around 90 on the U.S. dollar index, we should consider it to still be in a significant bull market uh, because these typically do run for four to five years. So this one's still got lots of time to run. What's happening with commodities? Um, well, you know, if we look at the flip side of the U.S. dollar, um, 
what you're going to see both in terms of commodities and the other currencies, um, it fits pretty much part and parcel here. Um, we we had excesses on the um, the yen and the Canadian dollar into December through March, and they um, um, both appear um, to have based out quite nicely in here. Um, and uh, when we look back at this type of hard decline, say in the Canadian dollar over the uh, years, we had two bear markets, 1970s and the 1990s, and when the dollar became this oversold, the Canadian dollar, it classically rallied back to the 20 and 50 week moving averages during the uh, the pauses and the decline. So at, at this point, I think we can be looking at uh, the Canadian dollar for um, it to go up and probably challenge the 82 to 85 cent level. And uh, from the uh, European point of view, uh, the euro uh, took it uh, probably harder than any of the other currencies in uh, the last uh, six weeks or so. It was having trouble basing out, but uh, we can see that getting back maybe into the 115 area. Um, now, commodity-wise, um, most commodities uh, have been uh, stabilizing here since the end of January. Uh, pretty, I should say, you know, choppy, but they are um, giving up uh, very, very little ground on a, on a uh, go-forward basis. So you're starting to see this rounding out bottom, whether it be in the grains or whether it be in the uh, metals or if uh, into the energy complex. And, uh, you know, we've talked about oil uh, in the past. When you get these um, really hard breaks like we had into January, uh, typically you're going to take uh, two to three months to thrash around, create the consolidation to have a decent rally. Um, and the overhead resistance right now uh, on oil appears to be in that 50 to $52 range. If it can get through there, I think 57 becomes a pretty reasonable target. Um, I like to look for the 100-day moving average to be tested during these consolidations in the oil. Um, and uh, the part and parcel with that, um, you would look for the energy stocks to um, outperform the broad market as we go through this type of a phase right now. What's happening with transportation? Uh, continues to be heavy. Um, the U.S. airline stocks uh, starting to break down through their supports of the last couple of months. Um, and so we've got that big divergence still sitting there with the, tr uh, the, Dow, tra the Dow transports uh, failing to make a new high after uh, the uh, end of December. Uh, whereas the industrials um, and the S&P and the um, NASDAQ, the Russell 2000, all put in new highs. But these type of divergences um, have been the type that uh, we've said before can produce uh, corrections of 8% or more uh, as far as the broad market is concerned. And, um, you know, that's uh, there, there's nothing here to say that uh, that uh, couldn't be in the cards at this point. Did the railway companies make a lot of money because they were shipping a lot of oil, and now there's less demand for oil? Well, yeah, that's that's starting to drop off. There's no question about that. Um, you know, and every time you have one of these accidents, uh, it uh, it then you know brings a headline item that uh, also makes people pause and think about uh, other means of transportation. You know, in terms of the oil, do you start to push in terms of the pipeline side of things as well. I we, thought it was. Uh, I was going to say I thought it was interesting. In Vancouver, they protest pipelines. In Seattle, they're protesting train traffic and they want to get pipelines right i mean it it, it, it all depends where you are the local environment and um, it's uh, it's uh, a matter of um, proximity to you know wh wherever the issues are the uh, you know we looked at um, say these these breaks uh, in in the energy markets like oil and uh, after the first break in oil um, as it starts to stabilize, what you see uh, is that you go from a phase where declining oil prices are good for the economy until you get to the point where oil prices find a low, stabilize, and then um, when you when you get to there, as we did at the end of January, uh, you'd expect that that would be continued good for the, the economic conditions in terms of what you would see in the Standard and Poor's and the, and the Dow. But what we've seen in the past, and this is well, maybe six times in the last three decades, is that once the oil market finally starts to bottom out, you're about, you're within six weeks, I should say, of an interim high in the equity market. And the high that we put in here, March the 2nd, fits pretty much into place. So um, this 
this consolidation that we're seeing in terms of the broad markets right now, um, having difficulty on the upside is just so natural to see following that, that hard break in the oil. Um, the other thing that fits together with this is that uh, at the beginning of the year, we started to see the high-yield bonds uh, in relationship with the treasuries moving such that we saw a flip down in the treasury prices and, a, and an uptick in the high yield market. That happened in January and into the end of February, and that is part of what creates that sort of risk on mode in the marketplace where people are um, going out and investing and taking some chances. But when the that falling period, when the bond market then gives up enough ground that it gets down to its longer term rising moving average, which in this case we look at as a 40 week. Once that happens, which did here about four weeks ago, that also is indicative of an interim high in equities. So we've got a number of the pieces here that just say, you know, caution um, is advised here. Uh, we did have um, an unusual number of uh, strong marches for the last uh, decade or so. We were overdue for a poor march. Um, so I don't think it should be a surprise here that uh, uh, a bit of a correction is underway. Ross, thanks a lot for chatting with us. Look forward to being with you next week. My guest has been Ross Clark, Investment Advisor at CIBC Wood Gundy in Vancouver. If you have any questions for Ross, you can email him at ross.clark at cibc.ca. Coming up, Adam Hamilton, CEO of zealllc.com on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. My guest is Adam Hamilton, CEO of ZealLLC.com. Adam, welcome to This Week in Money. Thank you so much for having me, Jim. It's great to be here. One thing I'd like to know right away, what is Zeal LLC? Zeal LLC is a little company I founded 15 years ago. I've always been a private investor, and I've always been researching the markets, and I thought, why not sell my research in the form of newsletters? So we publish weekly and monthly newsletters, uh, comprehensive reports on mining stocks, um, all kinds of research for investors and speculators around the world. Now, I'm sure you have a newsletter that goes along with your company. Can you tell us about the newsletter? We actually have two of them, Jim. We have a weekly one for speculators called Zeal Speculator. That's published once a week. We have a monthly one for investors called Zeal Intelligence, published once a month. And, uh, yeah, I recommend anybody check them out if they're interested. They're just chock full of information about the markets and contrarian investing and all kinds of great stuff people can't get from the mainstream media. And we'll have the uh, way to get a hold of those websites at the end of this interview. So you don't have to memorize anything yet. When it comes to gold and silver markets, what do you think is going to move first and how big of a move? Well, Jim, I think gold's going to move first. Um, I've been watching the markets my entire life, and I've been watching the markets full-time, like every minute, every day for 15 years. And gold just leads silver. You can do historical studies, as we've done at Zeal, um, over the past you know, 40 or so years since uh, gold got released from the peg in the U.S. dollar terms. And gold always moves, always moves first, or almost always moves first, 99% of the time. There's rare times when silver will spike on buying when gold doesn't, but that's, that's really uncommon. So I think gold will move first, and I think the catalyst initially will probably be future short covering. There's just incredibly large uh, short positions by American futures speculators and comics gold futures, and they have to cover these positions legally. And short covering is what usually sparks gold rallies. And the moment gold starts moving, within minutes, silver will follow it, and amplify and leverage just moves. So I think gold will move before silver, but sil silver will follow it closely and leverage that upside. When things start to move, is it going to be a fast move or will it be gradual? Well, if short covering is indeed the catalyst, it should be pretty rapid. Um, you know, future speculators have just extreme leverage. Uh, in the U.S. stock markets, leverage is legally limited to two, two, two to one, thanks to the Federal Reserve's Regulation T from 1974. But in the futures markets, the leverage is, is way higher. Um, for instance, in silver today, the minimum margin for a COMEX silver contract is uh, $7,700 to hold one contract. But each contract controls 5,000 troy ounces of silver. And at $17, that's worth $85,000 today. And that's 11.0 times leverage. And really, that's really low for futures. If you go back in time, the margins aren't much higher, yet silver has been priced a lot higher. So 25 to 30 times leverage on futures contracts is not uncommon at all. And if you have even 20 times leverage and a price moves against your trade by 5%, you risk taking a 100% loss on your position if you're a future speculator running at minimum margin. 
And so once short covering rallies start, they tend to run really fast because traders, each 1% move higher in silver or gold just takes out huge chunks of traders' capital if they're running close to minimum margin. And so they're just forced to buy quick to cover those positions. Is that where people get into trouble trying to cover these shorts? They certainly can. Um, you know, short covering obviously drives the price higher. And the higher the price goes, the more short covering it begets. And so a vicious cycle forms if you're short. You buy the cover, then the next guy has to buy the cover. But that makes prices go up faster, so everybody has to buy the cover. And the more people buying the cover, the, the, the faster and sharper the rally and the more violent it is and the more risky it is to the shorts. And so it definitely feeds on itself. And it's definitely a big risk for people running running high leverage. What caused the bear market in gold and silver over the past few years? That's a great question. And man, it's been a rough time for alternative investors like myself. Um, the last two years have just been brutal beyond belief, just the ultimate test of contrarian's metal. Uh, I've thought about this for <laughs> thousands of hours and researched it and studied it. I think the Federal Reserve's third quantitative easing campaign is the culprit. Back in uh, late 2012, September 2012, the U.S. Federal Reserve launched its third quantitative easing campaign. That's when the Federal Reserve prints money out of thin air and buys U.S. Treasury, U.S. Treasuries and also mortgage-backed securities. And there were two quantitative easing campaigns before that since late 2008, but they had set sizes up front. The Federal Reserve said, okay, we're going to buy, you know, this, this, this amount of trillion, this amount of hundreds of billions of dollars worth of this type of securities, and it's going to be over at this time. And so traders knew what to expect. But for QE3, the Fed just made open-ended. Hey, we're going to buy X amount a month for as long as it takes, um, and we, we, we're not going to have an end date on it. And to make matters worse, the Fed went so far as to jawbone all the time. It would tell stock traders that if the economy weakens, we're going to increase our monthly quantitative easing purchases or printing our money to buy treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And stock traders took that as Fed code to mean if the stock market starts selling off materially, the Fed's going to step in and buy more treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, and that will push the stock markets higher. So, th so this widespread belief formed in early 2013 that the Federal Reserve would effectively backstop the U.S. stock markets, and that short circuit normal market cycles like uh, corrections and bear markets and even pullback magnitude sell-offs. And so stock traders, American stock traders stopped worrying about sell-offs. They just bought every minor dip. You know, the the U.S. S&P 500 would go down 2 or 3%, 4% maybe, and they'd buy it instantly. So there were no 10% corrections, no big sell-offs to rebalance sentiment. And one thing about gold, Jim, is it's one of the few assets in the world that moves contrary to the stock markets. And so as U.S. stock markets just melted up starting in early 2013, thanks to the Fed's QE3, the gold prices started to sell off and sell off and sell off. Um, back in... Uh, April 2013, it plummeted once it broke major support, um, and, uh, and that just really scared traders. The futures, American futures speculators piled on huge then on the short side. They ramped up their short positions to just incredible levels, uh, actually record levels in mid-2013. And ever since then, um, as the stock markets continue levitating, investors didn't want anything to do with gold because gold moves contrary to stock markets. And... Demand for gold increases when stock markets are weak or selling off, and they weren't, obviously. And that gave future speculators free reign to kind of buffet the gold and silver prices around with their short positions. And so I really think the Fed's third quantitative easing campaign is what screwed up and distorted the global market so much over the past two years. There's no doubt in my mind. Do the Dow, the S&P, and the U.S. dollar look like they're topping? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I've been studying the markets for decades, and I've never seen them this toppy. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, Let's we'll start with the dollar. That just went parabolic. Um, since last summer, it just had its biggest, second biggest and fastest rally in history per the U.S. dollar index. That's a basket of the U.S. dollar against a uh, half dozen currencies. Um, up in Canada, you guys have seen the impact on Canadian dollar, I'm sure. It's just gotten crushed by this parabolic rally in the U.S. dollar. And uh, there's only one other do rally in dollar history that's been bigger than that, and that was during the stock panic in 2008 when people rushed to the U.S. dollar as a safe haven. And after that, the dollar collapsed. We're talking a correction in the order of 17% over 10 months or so. After that, there's kind of an aftershock rally a little later, and the dollar collapsed again after that by another 17%-ish over 10 months or so as well. So I think the dollar is, did go parabolic. It is topping, and it's going to sell off fast. That's great news for the Canadians um, who, who want to buy stuff uh, not made in Canada. Um, the stock markets are crazy toppy, too. Uh, there's a couple ways to look at that. I think the first and most important is valuation. You know, the core mission and tenet of investing is to buy low and sell high. And so you want to buy cheap things. If you're buying a house, you want to buy it cheap. If you're buying a car, you want to buy it cheap. If you're buying a vacation, you want to buy it cheap. And the same with stocks. And uh, the, the metric to measure that is valuation, is price-to-earnings ratios. And if you look at the trailing 12-month price-to-earnings ratio of the 500 stocks in the U.S. S&P 500, which is kind of the global stock index benchmark, it's right around 26 times earnings right now, and that's just insane, incredibly overvalued. Uh, 
125 year average fair value is about 14 times. And at this stage in the, in the stock market cycles, it should be around 10 times. And so 26 times is just incredible. Actually, Jim, 28 times is bubble territory, technically, historically. So on a trailing 12-month earnings basis on the S&P 500 companies, we're actually challenging bubble valuations in the United States. That's unsustainable. And uh, to exacerbate that, U.S. corporate earnings are actually shrinking this quarter. Uh, we just finished Q1. Today's April 1st um, as we talk. And uh, Q1 earnings are projected to drop about 3% or so in the U.S. It, it'll probably be more thanks to the U.S. dollar impact. About half the sales of the S&P 500 companies come from overseas. So that parabolic U.S. dollar rally since last summer is going to have a huge adverse impact on uh, corporate earnings the S&P 500 as a whole. And if earnings drop, the valuations will look even higher. So the stock markets are extremely toppy from a valuation standpoint, very, very expensive. And there's also a, a market cycle standpoint. Uh, this, this cyclical bull market in stocks, which the bulls call a secular bull market, started back in March 2009. And it's been 41 months now since the last 10% correction. And that's due to the Fed's distortions in QE3, which we discussed a little while ago. Typically, in a normal healthy bull market, you see a 10% correction about once a year or so on average. And we're you know, up around three and a half years. And so from a cycle standpoint, the market's way overdue to sell off as well. There's this indicator in the U.S. called the, the VIX, V-I-X. It's a fear gauge. It looks at implied volatility and options trading for S&P 500 options a month out. Anyway, if it's low, traders are complacent. If it's high, they're scared. And the VIX has been super low for, for you know, a year now, essentially, because people are just so complacent. And complacency is another sign of topping. So while you look at valuations, uh, cycles, um, sentiment, which drives short-term market moves, the U.S. stock markets look incredibly toppy, as does the U.S. dollar today. I was going to say, it's pretty toppy. Might need an oxygen mask up there. It's crazy, man. It's just incredible. You know, every day I wake up and uh, I turn on CNBC at 5 in the morning and see what happens in the world, and I just, I just shake my head in incredulity about how the markets can be like they are today. They're so messed up because of central bank distortions. They're so artificial, so unnatural, so crazy. And I just, it, it's not going to end nicely. You know, you can't. You can't pull a rubber band apart forever and not have a break. You can't stretch markets forever. You can't, you know, do price floors and price ceilings, like set interest rates forever and not have adverse consequences. And it's just, you do need an oxygen mask. It's just, it, it's mind-boggling how crazy things are and how defiant of all historical precedent they are today. How do the stock markets and gold and silver interreact? That's really important, and that really explains a lot in the past couple of years, Jim. Obviously, gold's just kind of fallen off a cliff in early 2013 and been bottom feeding, you know, for the past couple of years because of the Fed's third quantitative easing campaign. And that's because gold moves contrary to stock markets. Um, gold is an alternative investment. Gold is something people buy when they're, they're worried about stocks, they're worried about conventional investments, worried about bonds. And so gold has a long, proud history moving contrary to stock markets. And, and silver follows gold, so silver's the same way. When I say gold, I, I'm thinking precious metals in my head and I say gold. So yeah, so as the stock markets go higher, gold falls out of favor. As they go lower in bear markets or corrections, gold comes back into favor. And uh, so the stock markets have a huge inverse correlation to gold and silver investment demand. What percentage of traders take delivery of the metals they order? <laughs> Man, I assume you're talking American futures markets, and I don't have that information, but I bet it's zero, effectively. I mean, I, I don't think there's any physical delivery, and I think that's one of the big problems of the futures markets. Um, as we discussed earlier a little bit, uh, futures markets are highly leveraged. You can run you know, 10, 20, 30 times leverage in futures compared to just two times in the American stock markets. And so traders can have this huge influence on prices with relatively little, little amounts of capital. And if they don't take delivery, it's all fiction. It's all kind of a, a, a fake, a fraud, a side game. And uh, I think the amount of delivery has got to be effectively zero. I know there's people who study that stuff. Um, that's not one thing. We've, that's not something we've looked at at Zeal, but it's extremely low, Jim. Is the commitment of traders a good indicator of price movement in gold and silver? It's my understanding money managers have the largest short position ever in gold. Yeah, commitments of traders is really important. Um, in, in normal times when the markets aren't distorted by central banks, investment demand drives gold and silver prices. That's where the demand is in the margin. I mean, there's some industrial demand for gold, uh, more for silver relative as a percent of total global demand. But when investors are really turned off to precious metals like they are today because the stock market's been levitating for a couple of years thanks to the Fed with no material sell-offs, um, the fee American futures markets just dominate price action. And the commitments of traders are published once a week by the U.S. Commodities Futures Trading Commission, and that report shows what kind of positions futures speculators have in, in gold and silver futures, and they're super important. Um, on our website, there's a couple of recent essays, uh, Silver Poised to Surge and Gold to Fuel Silver Up Leg, and there's, a, there's charts in there that show large and small speculators' positions in gold and silver futures versus the prices of gold and silver. 
in the correlation between gold prices and silver prices to, to American speculator shorts is just perfect. Um, when American speculator shorts surge, gold and silver just claps. When American speculators buy to cover those gold and silver shorts, uh, the prices surge. And so when investors are gone from a market, the American future speculators just dominate it. So they're, they're just, they're incredibly important right now. Um, as far as the record positions, Jim, you mentioned, um, that's probably true. There's actually two formats of, of, of COT reports. And being an old school guy, I prefer the old format, which just has three categories of traders. Um, essentially, they're hedgers. You know, people actually use gold and silver for either they mine it or they use it in production, in industrial fabrication, jewelry, something. Then there's speculators, large and small speculators. And I look at the hedgers versus the large plus small specs as two categories. Um, the new format COT reports divide them out into more categories, and there's different investment categories. Um, I, uh, I have some technical issues with that. I think it's kind of nebulous and kind of subjective how they're categorized there, so I use the old format reports. Um, for the old format reports, gold futures uh, shorts rose to a 14 and a half, at least a 14 and a half year high, probably an all-time high in mid-2013, and now they're getting back up there. Um, they were, let's call it just north of 175,000 contracts short in gold back in mid-2013. In the latest uh, COT read from last week, they were at 151,000, and that's probably the third highest in history from a spike standpoint. And so that's old, old format. And, and silver's pretty high as well. Silver's up at uh, 43,000 contracts short. The high was actually 70,000 um, back late last year, so it's significantly down from there, but it's still really high in historical context. Uh, on the silver side, that 43,000 contracts short, if you take the average of American future speculators' silver short contracts in 2009 to 2012, those were the last normal years before the Fed's QE3 campaign started massively distorting the markets. They're only 21 and a half thousand. So American speculators' silver shorts contracts are about twice the normal year average when the Fed isn't in the markets. So there's just a huge amount of room to cover. Um, we're talking if they bought back down to their average level in 2009, 2012 on the silver side, they'd have to buy about 109 million ounces worth of silver to cover just those positions to get them back to average. And uh, according to the Silver Institute, Back in 2013, the last year they published data for, uh, global demand for coins and bars all year long in 2013 was like uh, 246 million ounces. So the short covering just to get back to average by American silver future speculators would be the equivalent of like a half year's, almost a half year's worth of global silver coin and bar demand in 2013. So just incredible how big these short positions are. So even if they're not record, they're, they're darn close to it, and there's, there's huge short covering coming. In a recent article, you wrote about a silver short squeeze. Please explain. Yeah, that, that just plays into leverage inherent in futures. Uh, you know, once again, uh, a single Comex silver futures contract controls 5,000 troy ounces of silver. At $17 silver, that's worth $85,000. Yet you only have to keep $7,700 in your margin account right now to, to buy that silver futures contract. So when speculators short silver, they effectively borrow silver and they sell, they sell it short. They borrow silver they don't have, they sell it in the open marketplace. They have a legal obligation to buy that silver back to repay their debt. And the way they do that is they buy an offsetting long contract uh, in the silver futures market. And if, they, if they're running minimum margin at 11 times leverage right now and silver moves against them by 5%, they risk a 100% loss in their capital invested. And that's just colossal. So once silver rallies 2-3% or so, these shorts get super nervous if they're running highly leveraged positions. They have to buy to cover before they get totally wiped out. And, and the futures trading houses enforce this too. The, uh, the American future system is really good about making sure traders can fulfill their obligations. So the margin clerks force these guys to cover even if they don't want to, if a trade moves against them. And so what, what happens in a short squeeze is you know, silver rallies a bit, some shorts start getting nervous, so they buy to cover their contracts. They're in the futures market, there's no difference between buying a contract to cover a short and buying a new contract. It's the same upside price impact. So as they buy to cover, the silver price rises, and the more they buy to cover, the faster it rises. But of course, the faster it rises, the other, the more it makes other silver speculators nervous. They have to buy to cover, and this whole thing becomes a self-feeding cycle. And so silver can rally really fast when silver future speculators get scared and have to start covering shorts. The more they cover, the faster silver rises. The faster silver rises, the more they have to cover. It's, it's really a beautiful thing if you're, if you're long silver. I definitely think one's coming in silver. Um, it's probably going to be fueled by gold. Uh, you know, gold drives silver. If you look at the correlations since early 2013, uh, something like 95% of silver's daily price action is directly mathematical explain, mathematically explainable by gold's own. And so I think we're going to see a gold short covering rally first. The gold shorts are more extreme per the old school COTs right now than the silver silver shorts. 
And once gold starts moving higher aggressively, decisively, um, the silver is just going to shoot higher, and a big part of that's going to be short covering by the American futures speculators. So yeah, short squeezes are really exciting things. I can't wait to see one. Well, as you said, you can't wait to see one, but what's that going to do to the traditional ratio between gold and silver? It's usually 16 to 1. Right now, it's around 70 to 1. Are we ever going to see what we call normal again? Absolutely. We're, we're definitely going to see. You know, markets are forever cyclical. That's one of our my core tenants here at Zeal. You know, markets move in cycles. They go up, they go down. You know, there's great waves of bull and bear markets through history. Yet you have these extremes from time to time, like the, the stock markets right now, the commodities markets. Everybody loves stocks, thinks stock markets are going to rally forever, that they're never going to sell off. Everybody hates commodities. Everybody hates precious metals. And these, these emotions are cyclical, too. There's going to be a point here when people decide that maybe gold's not a bad investment with a dollar so high, with you know, trillions of dollars, new money created out of thin air by the U.S. Federal Reserve with uh, all the problems in the world, with the high valuations of the stock market. Investors are going to return to gold and silver. They are going to realize that diversification is an important principle again, which they've forgotten in the past couple of years thanks to the Fed. And as they do that, gold will rally, silver will rally. And, and when gold's in an up leg, like a, a long, you know, multi-month, multi-year uh, rallying cycle, silver almost always leverages its gains. You know, we're looking at two, three, maybe four to one upside for silver relative to the gold's upside. So silver will rally faster than gold on balance. And as that happens, obviously the silver-gold ratio will mean revert towards more normal levels. These levels are so extreme right now. Um, Jim, one thing I like to, one thing about silver I've found is that it's kind of a sentiment indicator for gold. When gold's doing well, investors will flock into silver to leverage gold's gains. But when gold's doing poorly, investors abandon silver. And that's why that ratio is so screwed up right now. So as investors return to gold, they'll also return to silver. And Excuse me. Silver will rally much faster than gold, and that will that will restore the ratio to much more normal levels. And actually, from the principal mean reversion, there's a high probability it'll it'll not just stop right at the mean. It'll go it'll overshoot the opposite side. When you have an extreme to one side in sentiment, like extreme fear in the metals markets right now, usually when you have mean reversion, it overshoots to the opposite side. So we should have a uh, an extreme in greed at some point. And then the silver gold ratio is going to be incredible. You know, just the opposite extreme. Silver's going to be love. Silver's going to fly. It'll be really fun for the long-suffering silver investors, uh, a long uh, and well-deserved reward for them. We're speaking to Adam Hamilton, CEO from ZealLLC.com. Adam, will gold be one of those things that becomes so unaffordable that silver has to become the poor man's gold? That's a great question. That's always been a, a big point of silver's allure, the fact that you can get more units per your U.S. dollars or Canadian dollars than you can with gold. And uh Definitely, you know, gold gold should absolutely be gold needs to go a lot higher at some point um, as as these market cycles reverse. As that happens, silver will feel a lot more affordable to people. And uh, but it's not just the price; I think it's the upside. Silver has much more upside than gold when the precious metals rally. Silver is a much smaller market than gold. Um, silver doesn't have these giant central bank reserves like gold that can be sold into the marketplace. So silver just as just as has explosive potential as gold rallies. I think uh, Roy Jastrom back in the early 80s called it the restless metal, and that's so apropos for silver. It's just such a volatile metal. And uh, so I think the appeal to investors is not just the fact you can get more units per whatever amount of dollars you have to invest, but the fact that uh, you have much more upside than gold. Would you look at a basket of stocks such as the uh, SIL miners ETF, or would you look at specific stocks? You know, at Zeal, we're stock pickers. Uh, we've spent decades studying individual stocks. Uh, we just finished a three-month project looking at the world's silver stocks. You know, the, the silver market has just been decimated in this past year, these, these extremely anomalous prices, thanks to the Fed's stock market levitation. And so my business partners and I were really interested to see what, what, how the silver companies were doing. You know, could they survive at these prices? Could they pay their debts? Could they, you know, were they, basically, were they going concerns? Were they, was the silver industry viable at these prices? And, uh, we were just amazed, you know, we've looked at these companies for decades, a lot of them, and, uh, you know, some companies that are, used to be strong are really struggling at these prices, Jim. The prices are too low to be sustained for long from a production standpoint. And uh, yet we found companies that are doing fine as well. Their costs are low enough. Uh, they're, they're well run. They have strong balance sheets and minimal debt. And so I've always been a stock picker. I prefer individual stocks. But that being said, there's nothing wrong with ETFs. Um, for investors who aren't comfortable with individual stocks or who might not want to deploy sufficient capital in, in their precious metals part of their portfolio to have an individual stock portfolio. The ETFs are just fine. Um, the ETF guys generally do a good job picking which stocks to put in portfolios. Um, they look at the same fundamentals that hardcore stock analysts like we do. And um, the only drawback is they pick a lot more companies. You know, we might pick a portfolio of five or ten elite silver stocks. They might have 
you know, 20, 25. And, you know, the more stocks you have, the more diversified you have, but the, necessarily the lower your return. You want to have those stocks that are going to have the returns on the far right side of the bell curve. They're just huge, outs, huge outside upside returns. And the more stocks you have in your portfolio, the harder it is to, to narrow down on those, those ones that are really likely to soar. So there's nothing wrong with ETFs, but personally, we prefer stock picking at, at Zeal. For silver, do you prefer bullion, coins, ETFs, mining stocks, or belt buckles? <laughs> Being a belt prairie buckles. boy. <laughs> I grew up in North Dakota, you know, did the rodeo scene. Those belt buckles are beautiful, you know, big as a dinner plate. Um, I've always been a physical silver guy, Jim. Um, I, you know, I, being a contrarian, I've always had just this inherent mistrust of government and banks and uh, all the institutions built on these fragile shifting sands of fiat money. So I've always encouraged our clients and everybody I've talked to to have a core position in physical gold and physical silver in your own immediate possession. Um, once you have that bullion allocated and laid up, you know, stored away secretly someplace where you can access it where it's not controlled by a bank or government, then you can get into silver stocks if you'd like. But uh, I think physical gold bullion is the way to go. Coins are fine. Um, often you can get bars for lower premiums than coins. I'm all about the, the most silver or gold you can get for the lowest dollars. I don't care about numis, numis, numismatics, can't even say the word, <laughs> or a collector's value. I just want raw bullion, the most I can get for the, the money I'm going to invest. That's what I advise our clients as well. Um, after you have that core physical position laid in, you know, the, the stocks are fine. And for, for some investors, ET, uh, the silver ETFs are fine, like SLV in the States, uh, GLD in the States. Um, I know there's some Canadian ones as well. Uh, you know, there's some people, for instance, in American retirement accounts who might not be able to buy physical gold bullion or physical silver bullion. And for them or for uh, hedge funds who can't do physical metals trading, they can get the functionally identical port exposure in their portfolio from the ETFs. But from a portfolio insurance standpoint, if you're worried about markets, you know, crashing or something crazy happening, you're better off having the physical commodity in your own possession. But if you just want price exposure, the ETFs are fine. But still, I think everybody should have some core position in physical physical bullion in their own fist. For silver stocks, do you like low-cost or high-cost producers, pure silver plays, or companies where silver is a byproduct? Well, definitely don't like byproduct silver companies as silver stocks because whatever their primary metal is, that's how the, that's how the stock price is going to move. So byproduct silver stocks are just not interesting to me at all. The low-cost or high-cost question is really interesting, Jim. Um, Right now, everybody's kind of hunkered down in survival mode, and so we find ourselves looking at low-cost producers with that are spinning off cash even at $16, 17 silver because they're going to be able to survive even if these market anomalies last for longer, which we don't think they will. We think they're about at their end. Um, but the, the benefit of high-cost producers is the closer your cost of producing is to the current silver price, the more your profits will multiply as silver rises. And so with high-cost producers, you get vastly more profits leveraged to the upside of silver than you do low-cost. Like say, say silver's trading at $20 an ounce, and you have a company producing at $10 an ounce, and silver goes to $30 an ounce, you double your profit in low cost producer. But if you have a company producing at, uh, you know, $20 an ounce, and silver's at 20 now, and it goes to 30, you know, you effectively add infinite upside in leverage, or say from 19 to 20, like 10 times upside if you went from $19 to, to 30. Um, so the, the higher your cost of production, the more profits leverage you have, and ultimately stock prices follow profits, but, you know, Given the beating we've taken in precious metal stocks in recent years, we're on the conservative side and low-cost side, but there's definitely a market for the high-cost ones, too, because their upside leverage is going to be so massive as these metals mean revert higher. What countries do you like best for silver, and are there countries you would definitely ab avoid? Well, Mexico is kind of the hotbed of silver production right now. Um, Mexican mining law seems pretty, you know, pretty, I don't even know the word. Just, it's, it's good to foreign investors. Foreign investors don't have problems there. There's tons and tons of Canadian and American companies mining gold and silver in Mexico and exploring for gold and silver in Mexico. You know, Mexico has a, you know, four or five hundred year history of mining and, uh, there's so many places to explore. It's just a good place. It's close to uh, the U.S. and Canada. It's easy for companies to, to get infrastructure there. There's no weather issues. Uh, geopolitical issues are minimal. Um, so, so Mexico is a great place. Um, as far as countries to avoid, uh, you know, we, we tend to look at governments at zeal and we look at the laws. You know, there's countries that seem mining friendly, yet they pass new laws that uh, are a pain. For instance, uh, Tahoe Silver, a big new producer um, in Guatemala, the, the Guatemalan legislature just recently passed a law that really upped the royalties. Uh, Tahoe's fine, no big deal. They have huge cash flow. But, you know, we hate situations like that where the government can turn against miners. Uh, one, one big problem with mining is you're essentially held hostage of government because you can't pick up your operations and move. You can't just move your factory to, to a different country if uh, the government gets hostile to you. So there's some places in South America with poor governments 
like you know Bolivia, for instance, we 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 wouldn't look kindly on. But uh, Mexico is a great place. Um, and most of the exploration, most of the companies that you can buy on the American Canadian stock exchanges are actually exploring in countries that are are fairly favorable for foreign foreign investment and mining. You know, companies don't invest tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in countries where they're likely to have that confiscated. So if you get a decent publicly traded company, odds are they're going to be in a place that uh, is geopolitically neutral, if not favorable. I, I just think about the Barrick Gold Pasqua mine there on the border between uh, Argentina and Chile. They've spent $8 billion. It, it could cost them actually more money than what the mine's worth. Yeah, that's been a nightmare situation, and that's always a risk of mining. And uh, in the last 15 years of, of, of doing this full-time, I just can't count the number of times we've just been incredibly discouraged, just kicked in the teeth by governments doing stupid stuff. Um, one group of agitators who could delay mines for literally a decade plus. You know, it's just ridiculous how asymmetrical the power is here. You have companies coming in creating, you know, hundreds of jobs, if not a thousand plus. They're investing up to billions of dollars in an economy. They're they're paying huge taxes to the government, and you have one group of locals who just wants to agitate. Um, sometimes the, their reasons are righteous, and sometimes they're just for money. But it's just it's terrible how the permitting process works, and how it can be delayed and screwed up, and you know, and the modern mining operations are so safe, they're so over-engineered, they're so technically, you know, just exceptional that it's really sad. It's a sad commentary on how hard it is to get a mine up and running these days. On the other hand, as an investor, the harder it is to get new mines up and running, the lower supply is going forward. So if you're lucky enough not to own a company like Barrick that has problems geopolitically, you know, the other companies will benefit because supply is constrained by all these geopolitical issues and, uh, you know, just problems that come through the pipeline. So it's a double-edged sword for investors. We try to avoid that stuff, but eventually, you know, sometimes it bites us and it, it's, it's really irritating when it happens. Do you have short and long-term targets for gold and silver? And are there price targets for possible breakouts? Um, on long-term targets, no, I don't really do that. Uh, you know, I, it sounds like a cop-out. I think gold and silver are going much higher, but I, I don't really have a target. Um, you know, one thing about market cycles is they always, they often tend to surprise. They they go longer than you expect, and so any upside target I have would probably be obsolete at the time. Um, you know, I look at inflation adjusted levels for gold and silver. Um, I look at where gold went in the 1980, that super spike that ended in early 1980, and uh, you know, I look at that inflation adjusted dollars, and you know, we could easily push 2,500, 3,000 dollars an ounce for gold at some point here. But if there's a crisis, if there's like a market crash or a currency crisis, if the U.S. dollar crashes, I mean, it could the sky's the limit. You could see prices way higher than that temporarily. Um, and I think silver would leverage that upside like it did in the ni- late 1970s and early 1980. We're talking huge upside here, but <clears throat> the extreme targets would be really temporary spikes, Tom, or, or Jim, I'm sorry, and they'd be short-lived. And so, you know, lots higher, don't know where. As far as breakouts, um, don't doesn't really matter. Not really a technical trader. Um, you know, we just need a decisive rally. We need gold and silver rally long enough and far enough for traders to believe it's real, and then investment capital will start flowing back in. Then they'll feed a new up leg that'll start lasting, that'll go for years or so. But there's no, it's not like if gold gets to, to 1250, it's going to run to the moon, or if silver gets to 20, it's going to rocket higher. You know, that that huge short covering could happen anytime. Um, investors could return anytime, depending on what the stock market's doing and U.S. dollar is doing. So no real technical targets. I apologize. Not, not our game. Adam, again, how can people get a hold of your website and sign up for the newsletter? Well, Jim, well, we're at Zeal, Z-E-A-L-L-C.com. Zeal is short for our passion for the markets and trading. Um, we have two newsletters, a, a monthly one and a weekly one for investors and speculators. We also have comprehensive reports. We just finished a three-month deep research project on silver stocks. Uh, we have a report up on the website that profiles our, our dozen favorites in depth. Uh, come on by, check us out. Adam, thanks a lot for chatting with us. Thank you so much for having me, Jim. It was great talking with you, and I look forward to coming back when uh, gold and silver are much higher and everybody's happy. My guest has been Adam Hamilton, CEO of ZealLLC.com. That wraps up our show for this week. Thanks to our guests, Ross Clark and Adam Hamilton, and thank you for listening. Comments or questions for This Week in Money can be emailed to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.